All right. So this week on the Spotlight Report, I am interviewing uh, Henry Kwok, who is a third year graduate student in the College of Optics. He was in, well, he is in the Loft Group, pardon me, uh, which is the research group that I was in when I went to the U of A. Uh, we did some research projects together. Uh, and Henry, I mean, I, I don't need to belabor it, but I thought that you were an excellent researcher and we've kept in contact, which has been a lot of fun. And you recently spoke to me and said that you uh, had comps coming up, which you passed, so congratulations. Um, you're in your third year, and this is kind of a key transition point from my recollection between being very focused on classes towards going towards you know, the, the role of a full researcher. Um, so when we spoke, uh, you had said that you were you know, fairly stressed about comps, but also somewhat stressed about the idea of when do you graduate, what research are you going to be doing, how do you make that transition? Uh, and this was interesting to me because I looked back at my journal, and after we had talked tonight, I was trying to think, how did I feel at the time? And for people that have met me when I was in grad school there, I, I had a cynical take on grad school. Um, <laughs> but I had gotten more optimistic by the end. So I read my journal and on an entry in my third year, uh, just prior, prior to taking the comps, uh, here's what I had to say. I quote, I have been stressed and unfocused and unable to feel satisfied about research for about a week and a half now. Still having trouble with research and feeling adrift and uninspired about the future. I can resolutely say I, expletive, hate my research. It is seemingly pointless, but God forbid the march for more papers halt to allow for a talk discussing what constitutes worthwhile research. Or maybe I just shouldn't be a researcher, close quote. So I surprised even myself at how cynical I was. Uh, and it, it was really interesting to me because um, I think it's taken for granted how hard grad school is mentally on students um, and how much you kind of have to work through and figure out. And, you know, I think you and I have spoken before. We had Chase on, uh, Eddie LaVilla as well was a guest, and many other people have spoken about the, the issue of mental health as a grad student that's kind of undervalued. So, this is interesting to look back and see that I think I can say I was not in a good mental health position. And I, I you know, thought a little bit more about it and realized, you know, you're going through the, the, the very least same setting and scenario, except you're doing it with the added stress of uh, this being during COVID. And you aren't able to go into the research lab, uh, which has a lot of implications, which we'll get into. So. With, without further ado, after that long monologue, um, I'm curious, how are you doing? You know, where are you at? And I want to hear what it's like now, not only as a third year graduate student um, in and around comprehensive exams and that transition, but what is it like now with the added difficulty and stress of doing this all with COVID being a, a factor? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me and introducing me, Logan. Uh, it's great to be here on the Spotlight Report again. And uh, just a first initial reaction to your journaling diary from around kind of where I am right now. I just finished most of my coursework. Um, I was fortunate enough to pass comps, um, the written and oral. And now I'm on this path of being an independent researcher, I guess the way that my meetings with my PI day work um, has evolved is, you know, now I check in with him and tell him what I think rather than asking for specific guidance every single time. And then he'll give me feedback when I ask for it, as well as pitch in what he thinks, rather than me just being totally lost, not knowing the norms, being unfamiliar with literature, what we've done, what we haven't done. I kind of know this now. And then I just have, um, you know, uh, I just have a bunch of ideas. I know how to execute on them. and. For that reason, it is even to greater discomfort because I know I'm fully capable of doing these things and that there's nothing standing in my way. For example, um, when I came in, when I was a wee lad in my first year and I was under your tutelage, Logan, you know, I'd be afraid of words like H-bar 
and coma and astigmatism, but now having taken a bunch of classes and discussed these in detail and gone to office hours and talked a lot with lab mates and people not belonging to lab. You know, I'm not afraid of these words anymore because I understand what they mean and their implications, but the pressure just mounts as into what's expected because these are no longer obstacles to my research. I am the obstacle to my research. And so waking up with that every day and knowing that I have to confront this, I, I guess that's the primary challenge of a PhD or that's so I'm thinking. You know, I've asked this question to a lot of people and they're, they, being PhD candidates as well, are just like, I don't know, and that, that's fair. Um, anyone who will ask who has a PhD will have given their survivorship life. So for me, I've stopped asking and just kind of accept that uh, it'll, the PhD will be whatever it ends up being for me because it's different for everyone. And so going back to um, the original questions, it, um, I, you know, I'm just left alone with just these goals to, of course, the endless march towards publications, as well as uh, this, you know, the realities of trying to execute on my, my ideas, because, you know, I have to ex execute on novel things, test novel things, uh, sometimes go into lab, and it can be an obstacle because how often do I want to expose myself to COVID, right? Every doorknob I touch, every uh, passageway I walk through, that's potentially some exposure. And it's, it's this weird shift now, too, because I have a mentee now, and where I was the mentee just two and a half years ago. And, y y you know, like, I don't know if you felt the same way, but now I taught someone how to use the CFM, and I taught, I'm teaching someone how to use the interferometer, and I'm like, you know, when I did this with Logan, I recorded every single thing and never watched it again. And the person I just mentored recorded every single thing. And I wonder if they'll ever watch it again, right? Because grad school just kind of comes at you and you learn things that you need and you think you're going to document things that matter. And perhaps they do matter, but like, you're not going to have time to go back for them. Like, you know, every plan that I formulated has just been beat back by, by, by reality. And I'm not even saying that in a negative tone. This is just a, as objective as I can be. It's just, uh, you know, I, I, I would say this as, oof, it would be a lot easier without COVID because as you're doing things, other people in lab see you struggle or see you try different things and they give their input in which you, they might be able to help you or you might be able to bounce ideas back and forth um, echoing until you find truth. But obviously that can't happen. And it's limited to how often people visit a shared Zoom room. And so you explicitly have to go out and seek answers to your own questions, which is, which is good, which is part of the process. I will say I've reached out more often than necessary because now the opportunities to discuss ideas can only, are only presented when you look for them rather than just being the right place and right time with the right people. Um, it's not as organic anymore. Right. And so perhaps, Research is halted in that way, in which I think um, research is, I mean, it's, you're, you're trying to become an expert in a specific field, a uh, very niche field. And the way you do that is not by talking to your PI on one-on-ones every week, every two weeks, every month, but talking with your peers who know just as much, but maybe are focused on different things and battling it out and arriving at truth. Perhaps those battles will educate you better eventually when you're the lone um, scientist or the lone um, optical engineer at some company and you're the only person that they could turn to and your word is truth and if you screw up it's on you and so uh, you know the ability to become that sort of researcher that dimension is taken away by COVID I think and you, you... yeah yeah it's it's interesting that you uh, mentioned I mean I think you hit upon a big thing which is responsibility becomes kind of a driving uh, concept around around the stage you're at. So let's take a step back as well for the people who are not as familiar with um, uh, the grad school and the College of Optics. So you spend your, your, actually, why don't you go ahead and describe what the process is loosely to graduate. As a graduate student from start to finish, what does it kind of look like? What are the stages? So the formal graduation requirements are a number of classes, which might optimistically take you three years if you do full course loads, um, and then maybe a, a half course load at the very end. You also have to pass a written exam 
which test you on four core subjects, which are E and M, geometrical optics, diffraction, and interference um, in quantum mechanics. Um, after that, you should be familiar enough with your field of intended research that you could write a short summary paper on what you intend to research, whether you've done it or not, and then defend yourself in your expertise or familiarity with that field um, in a verbal discussion and presentation over about an hour and a half. Um, after that, uh, you will be doing the research um, in which you're developing novel contributions, um, whether experimental, simulation-based, um, proof-based, um, to advance whatever niche you dedicated yourself to. And after enough publications, which is dictated by your specific optical subfield and your advisor, you might have the chance to propose your, your defense, write your dissertation, and then live happily ever after. So that's process, I think, should be between four and five and a half years for most people. So it will, and, and let's, and we'll give, I mean, to give added context, it's heavily dependent on your field. Uh, I think the average for optics is five years. That being said, if you're in quantum, it can take, I think the average is like seven years. Um, and if you're in different engineering fields, or if you're, I have a good friend who's, uh, girlfriend is in grad school for English and another one who, or I had another friend who was in grad school for philosophy, but five years was the short end of things. So, so grad school can heavily vary, but for the College of Optics, um, I'm willing to say that five years is like a good amount of time. Uh, and, and that if you are beating five years, um, that's unique. Uh, four, four years can be kind of like a remarkable thing to achieve. So you are in your third year and you just took the comprehensive exam, passed it. And then you also, uh, and what else? What is, so what was that process like? You took the comps and you also defended yourself via the oral exam, right? That's correct. Um, could you clarify what do you mean the, the process, the process of that written and oral, what was that like? Yeah, so, so what is it, I mean, why is it for people outside of the College of Optics grad school? It, uh, you know, the comprehensive exam and the oral exam is really daunting. It's like a really big, stressful, unpleasant thing to some people, to me, anyways. Um, and it's because your first two years, from my recollection, please, you know comment if you feel otherwise, but the first two years that I was in school, you're constantly learning new advanced topics. Um, you have a lot of people around you who might be better at these topics or might be particularly skilled in one, one class. For example, you mentioned ENM, that's um, electricity and magnetism. To give a funny story, or I found it funny anyways, uh, when we took the exams, the average on them, I think, was around like a 15 to 20%. And there was consistently one student uh, who would score between like a 95 and 100. And the professor would always make a point of saying, look, this isn't an impossible exam. Somebody understands it. And to make matters worse, the student who, who did so well was a very, very young grad student. I think he, he was about 17 at the time. So it was uh, extra egg on our face. Um, but you go through this period, this, this process of learning a ton of stuff. And then at the end, there's an exam. And it tests you on the four key subjects. And you better get it right. Because if you don't, you failed, right? You either pass or you fail. Um, and that, to me, was a very stressful process. So why don't you comment on that first? Sure. I can totally comment on that. I still remember it very vividly. Um, so uh, yeah, that exam is very daunting in that it's just four subjects. It's the four major classes you took in your first year. Everybody comes in from different backgrounds, such as physics, electrical engineering, some mechanical engineering like myself, or people even from optics colleges. And the pressure mounts because you know if you're from an op optics college, there's so much pressure to automatically pass. You get to know your peers very well. And there's this thing where like after you pass, or what if you don't? Right? What if your peers do and say, oh my gosh, that was horrible, but at least we passed. And you have to live through that for another year until you can retake it or retake part of it. You know, that's, that's horrifying because 
you want to coast off the momentum that you've already built. But if something, um, it's not standardized, but it's this discrete bar, you have to make it over. If you don't make it out of that bar, who's immune to these self judgments, right? It's, it's really tough to stay focused on future coursework if you don't have the confidence from some silly exam. You know, it, of course it's meaningless because it's just exam taking, but you know, it did matter to some point in which, you know, you'd have to retake part of it or not. And so, you know, that, that whole pressure, um, it, 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 it's really crazy. I've seen people um, postpone a year because um, they were unable to take it on that, on that very last day, whether it's due from stress or other extenuating factors. And, you know, that, that has an impact on how you proceed your entire next year, right? Um, that, that living through that is, is not easy. Yeah, and I and I, and you know you phrase it well. I think that it turns into this weird, a a weird comparison to your peers, which I think is kind of made up. And not that it's not valid, but I'm saying I think that students do this to themselves to their detriment. Um, if you have good peers, they should be your friends regardless of your outcome. Um, and I think most of them are. But but it, it's easy to get in your head and think like, oh no, you know, like I'm now separate from them. Um, and, and the other part of it is, you know, you've spent your entire life and career trying to get to this point. And if you fail, it feels like, wow, like, why am I doing this? You know, I, I spent all my life, on, you know, just for this and I, and I failed, um, which again, is a, is a silly and not realistic outlook, but I think it's something that people have. But that being said, you made it past that and you went to the oral portion. So can you explain what that oral defense, I don't know the exact term, so oral defense, oral exam, whatever it's called, can you explain what that looks like? Sure. Um, after you pass a certain number of classes and pass that initial written exam, you are able to petition a committee, which is four members representing three different subfields from optical engineering, optical physics, uh, I think, uh, oof, imaging science, and photonics and representing three, at least three of those areas um, to take a look at the field that you want to dedicate yourself to. Um, and they just review what you have prepared um, in a presentation about your field of research, whether it's on stuff you published or plan to research in and have done none of it, that's totally okay. They just wanna probe you with certain questions to make sure you know what you're talking about. For example, um, when I began talking about the infrared wavelengths that come from certain watery, vaporous clouds in distant galaxies, they'd ask me about Fourier spectroscopy, even though I had no idea the details of that and just made sure, you know, do you know what a Fourier transform is? Is what's the difference between spatial resolution and result result and um, other types of resolution? And you know, do you know what interference is? You you should know by now. You passed this certain exam. Or what's the sensitivity to this particular parameter or instrument um, that you're using to measure um, your measure end of interest? They, they're just making sure that you can talk coherently and I guess you can represent the field well and that you're ready to become an independent researcher. And so I felt they probed me for two hours like that. They, to go into a little bit more, if I had spoken uh, completely uninterrupted, I would have been around 28 minutes, but the entire process took about an hour and 28 because after every question, I would get I, I would get hammered with specific questions asking if I knew what uh, a, a certain term was. For example, like what is a lens? And people are like, oh, it's used to focus light, but actually it's a quadratic phase mask, right? And so there's certain uh, things that are fun questions for them to ask because you know, to me this was a big day, but for them this was just Tuesday, right? It was just a another it's another day for them making sure somebody knew what they were talking about. But right. after they've extinguished all their questions, the conversation kind of faded towards the one hour and 20 minute mark. And I just kept talking and they're, they, they felt fairly confident by then and gave me, furthermore, they gave me helpful contributions as for directions for my research and comments to explore if I actually knew what I was talking about. And that actually really helped me with my research. So it, it, was, it was a great discussion between four experts um, of different fields who, whom I might not talk to every single day. So it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. And not only might not, I think, well, you know, I'm commenting for myself, not for you, but I wouldn't have, I would not have sought out these random professors that were on my oral committee uh, and, and casually said, Hey, here's my work. 
uh, what do you think? Give me some critical feedback. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I agree with your description and I'm going to try to describe my perspective going into it. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then my perspective now and after, you know, after I passed, after the stress is gone, but going into it, um, I had done a lot of research. I, I had done research on deflectometry specifically, which I mean, if the audience listeners don't know that at this point, then man, I'm not doing my job very well. Um, but I, you know, I, I'd, I'd done quite a bit of research on deflectometry. I'm conversant in deflectometry and deflectometry is 0.001% of optics, right? So I now have to go and speak to a professor who is world renowned on quantum optics. Um, I have to speak to a professor who's world renowned on geometrical optics, a professor who's renowned on polarization, um, experts, like absolute, absolute experts, which comes with, you know, the, the, the nature of the College of Optics being kind of a world-class institution for this, but it's really daunting. I have to go and talk to them and defend what I'm doing and, and look like basically uh, competent, right, <laughs> to them. Um, I remember I had asked Dewook if I could blacklist a particular professor, not because he's a bad person or anything like that, but he was, uh, as are basically all professors at the College of Optics, he was just devastatingly smart. And I was terrified that he would ask me a hard question. Um, and I remember Dewook saying like, no, of course not. Why would you blacklist anyone? I don't think that's a good idea. Um, he wasn't on, I, the, this professor, professor in question wasn't on my committee, but so that was going into it. It was absolutely terrifying. You know, the smartest people I can think of in fields I don't really know, even though, yeah, I've studied them, um, are about to judge me. Is that, does that seem about accurate from your perspective? 100%, 100%. Um, okay. In fact, one of my committee members, um, Dr. Ewan, Ewan Wright, was just, one of his papers had just been selected to be, the, I think, the top 50 cited papers in physics in the last, like, three decades. And I was like, this was like two days before my, my my this this comprehensive oral oral defense. I was like, oh my gosh, I got a I got to brush up on optical physics, and that that was entirely scary. Right, right, and and you and uh, for our listeners, um, he 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 taught me anyways quantum optics, um, and he is undoubtedly just one of the most delightful people I've ever met. Did you get a chance, by the way, to ask him about the latest papers showing that the speed of light was broken? Unfortunately not. I was too terrified at the end to make That's any That's probably sort of... good that you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> too it's, a, it's a pet peeve topic of him. But, but I, anyways, I digress. So it's, it's, it's daunting. It's terrifying. And you're in a position that everything rides on this. These, you know, these people that you probably aren't casual good friends with, they're judging you. Afterwards, it was fantastic. I mean, I got such phenomenal insights from uh, Dr. Brian Anderson, who was the uh, quantum and physics heavy side of things. Um, uh, you know, everybody on my committee was extraordinarily generous with their time. This is this is my perspective, right? Post, uh, they are very generous with their time. They gave me just fantastic feedback, um, and my takeaway was like, wow, these professors uh, are helping me to do really good research. And I, I could comprehend that a part of it was like, you know, if you're really not there yet, then they would give you the feedback of like, look, you're, you know, you, you should probably touch upon these topics some more before you dive headfirst into research. Um, but because I didn't experience that, my, really my whole takeaway was like, this was just a great opportunity to get feedback from these experts, uh, and it and it felt very kind and generous. Um, so it was funny to me how totally different I looked at it afterwards. Is that what do you think? I think that's totally accurate. I would say that my initial terror was dampened, unlike unlike yours, because you know, with I would consider you a mentor um, who's gone through a very similar trajectory that I would hope to go on. And so without, I think, you know, I talked to you within weeks before the exam. So ha that helped calibrate my expectations and that it would be terrifying, but knowing that level of terror is helpful towards your level of nervousness, nervousness during the exam. And so I think I was slightly less terrified than you were. Uh, right. And I kind of knew what to get out of it going in because rather than coming in 
seeing that they could take so much away from me, I was coming in saying, hey, you could give me so much by giving me this feedback. So I, I came in with that attitude and it, it, it helped dampen the, the impact. Right, which I think is, a, is such a great perspective to have if you can have it. I, you know, we've, we've spoken to Isaac and you of course know Isaac, but uh, Isaac in, in his typical sage mode, he on his own went into the uh, oral exam with the, with that perspective of like, damn, this is great. They're going to help me. It'll be a cool discussion. And, you know, for anyone listening that is going to have to take an oral exam, I might not know your exact committee members, but I encourage you to try to take that perspective of, uh, this is probably a kind thing that they're trying to do and they're not out to get you. It's a discussion amongst peers, uh, and it'll overall help your research. Um, the other thing that I'll say is bring a bottle of water. This is what I tell every grad student. Bring a bottle of water. If they ask you a question, take a sip of water and think about the question before you answer because it's very easy to, to run your mouth and over answer uh, if you're not careful. Um, so, so after you finish that, you're, it's smooth sailing, Henry, right? You're done. I mean, you, it's, you, just have to, you just have to do some research and you're out of there. It's, it's crazy to think that, well, for, for some background right before this, I, I took four classes in the last semester, which is absurd because I took two polarization classes, which each had 10 assignments and not trivial homework sets. I was taking a math class called Opti 604 Advanced Mathematical Methods and it's all about orthogonal polynomials, pseudo inverses, SVD and wavelets and all sort of stuffs that I kind of and got I, lost. And I warned you about this class. I, I want the audience me. to note, I warned you about he warned this me course. several times. He reiterated. He, I said, is this the class I shouldn't take? And he was like, emphatically, yes. And what <laughs> did I do? I took it because I'm a goon. So I, I took it because reasons. And then I also took uh, lens design at the same time. So in, in overall, I had 43 assignments that semester and I got very little research done. But the stunning thing is now, after having passing comps, I feel like for the first week, I got even less done because in front of me is just a single class, optomechanical engineering. And you know, this is something I already feel a bit more comfortable with because I've come from a mechanical engineering background. Despite this, I'm getting even less work done because this weight of self expectations is weighing down on me. It's, it's crazy. I don't have assignments. I'm taking a class that I'm already a bit familiar with and not as, I'm not terrified. Um, yet, yet I feel, I feel like you, you know, the work is there. I have to do it, but it's a road I don't want to go up. It's like you're walking up a mountain. <laughs> so what, and, and what is that? What do you have to do, right? Because it's understandable. I think that this is a, a key thing for people to understand. Uh, your first two years, co the comprehensive exam and the oral exam, that's concrete, right? You take these classes, you take this exam, you defend yourself, and that's what you have to do. So now what do you have to do? It's you're guiding me to the right point because you've got to make that up. You've got to judge for yourself what steps those are going to be and not only what those steps are going to be, but how you're going to evaluate how well you did on those steps. For example, in the field of metrology, our goal is to make novel measurement solutions, but how do you measure something that is groundbreaking? Well, you've got to cross validate it against something that's art that can already measure the crazy optic, like a free form or a, a crazy a sphere or convex sphere you're trying to examine and you know it, it you you have to figure out how you're going to measure something you have to figure out if people will actually trust that you have to figure out during COVID how you're going to get access to that equipment how to be safe if you're working with your partners um, what you can feasibly do inside a simulation what will work what won't work who's available for example someone to want to talk to in OEFF is in Korea right now, and they're gone till February. And so I kind of have to And what is, to sorry, just to interrupt, what does OEFF stand for? Um, that is, I think the Optical Engineering Fabrication Facility. In, okay, okay. Um, that is the world-class team of op optical element fabricators and testers um, who make stuff like the GMT segments, um, DKIS, so I think the Daniel K. Inui Solar Telescope, um, tons, tons of stuff. Um, and so some of those experts, you know, you, you really got to reach out to them. And in, in a normal research day, you could casually go on an adventure, walk downstairs to the lowest floor 
um, and just talk to them. But now you've got to reach out, you've got to schedule. Um, and, you know, the PhD is becoming this, I, I, I would say it's still a blend of discovery, right? You're, you're, you're learning new things, you're finding out new ways of interpreting things and regurgitating it and explaining to others, which is a huge part of your education here. Um, but, but now it's this whole process in which you can still go down that road, but you, you've got to plan it out, you've got to schedule it in, and it's, it's not so simple. Right. And, and I, I like your description a lot. And I think that, at least for me at that stage, what I had to do, I mean, what I had to do was graduate. And in my mind, how I thought I had to graduate was papers. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's how you feel as well. But that was kind of the, the things that I thought that I needed to accomplish. And you phrase it extremely well how do you judge what papers to do? How do you judge how well you wrote a paper? How do you know if you're writing the right papers, graduate, et cetera? Like it, it shifts from some relatively objective metric about pass fail towards a very subjective thing defined by yourself and your advisor. Um, because you have to have that conversation with your advisor of what do I need to do to graduate? how many papers and et cetera. Um, so is that accurate as well for you? Totally accurate. Um, okay. Coming in, I was like, hey, I need three papers, right? Because my PI said this is a standard. But in, in the, especially in the recent past three months, I was like, well, will I get what I came for for the PhD? If I just write three papers, can they be on anything? Will they be meaningless if interconnected? Will they mean more if not interconnected? Um, and so, yeah, those, those those are great points, and I'm I'm still I'm still learning. You know, it's right. I'm five semesters in. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I hate to break it to you. You'll keep learning. Unfortunately, that's the uh, even post grad school. I I'm I'm probably learning more than I was in grad school. Um, but so have you? Well, this is a two part question. A, how do you decide what research you're going to do? And then B, have you decided that? That is like, what are you working on now? Um, I guess for figuring out what, well, I, I figured out kind of a Willy Wonka analogy to figure out what I want to do. You know, for me, I would say I, at the beginning of my PhD, I'm walking into this factory whose lights are out and I'm looking for three golden tickets in the dark. I don't know what they are, but I need three of them, at least three of them um, to get to the exit, to qualify to get to the exit, right? Um, and that exit would have just been defined as you need 54 units, 18 dissertation units, and to pass these certain exams and pass your oral defense. But but it's not so simple. Um, I, I would say the first couple of years are kind of like you get you're building a flashlight to learn around the area you want to see and see if you can see more of those golden tickets. And so seeing that way has been more illustrative. And what I've seen so far is that once you become familiar with a certain part of the room in which there's actually tons of tickets everywhere, that the, the, the whole room is made of tickets, all right. Um, but you, you, you learn which ones are worth taking as in, you know, it hasn't been done before, it's cool, it's part of your skill set, or potentially could be within your reach. And you decide to go for it. And it'll be a ton of work because no one's ever done it before. But then you, you've got to do it. And you decide to do what is most interesting to you because it's going to be painful. Writing is painful. Doing correct, correct tests is painful. Using correct uh, methods is painful to get right. And so that's that's kind of, kind of how I'm seeing it right now. As for how do you go go about deciding what you want to go to? You know, at the point of a comprehensive exam, I feel like you should be familiar with enough with your field such that you can identify these golden tickets that are up for up for grabs. You know, you'll still be pulling and tugging, but it, it, you know it's there. Um, and so that's kind of how I'm seeing. It. And I'm in that tiny corner or edge of the room right now where I see a couple of things that are potentially within reach. And so I've gone after them because they look painful, but, you know, based on my background and what I know, who else will it be to uncover that and put it in the literature except me? It's who, who else wants to make an optimal mechanical budget for deflectometry except me, right? So right, right. it's got to be me. So, so conversely though, what are, so, okay, you know, to summarize at the time that you took your oral exam, you know, these quote unquote golden tickets, you know, the topics that you're going to have to uh, produce original research for and write a paper for in order to graduate, right? That's the ultimate price. Um, so 
what's what are the what are the risks? What are the downsides? And I can I can see and I can remember uh, many about a research project. Um, but I, 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 first, I want to hear what your perspective is on that. Could you could you elaborate on that more? Like, well, uh, yeah. So let me. I'll I'll just share what what I what I thought about it at the time. Um, first of all, I can choose a research project. I'm going to sink a lot of time into it. Not only is my own time and uh, name to some extent writing on it, on the quality of the research and the quality of the output, but so is Daewook's name. So the advisor, pardon me, um, Daewook is both of our advisors. Uh, so is the lab's name to some extent. And so there's, you know, there's the aspect of quote unquote pride writing on it. There's the aspect of what if I do something wrong and it gets published and that's, you know, revealed then that's like catastrophic. I didn't worry about that too much. The biggest thing I worried about was I'm going to get scooped. I'm going to spend a bunch of time doing this and someone else is going to publish it right before me. Uh, so yeah, that's kind. Of, that's more so what I, what I was always worried about. I can comment on that in that I am similarly afraid. And I've decided to live life on the edge, always on the precipice of you know, sheer joy and sheer absolute dread in that you can go to Google Scholars and you can place an alert on certain keywords. So I finally mustered the courage because I've known about this for a long time. I set my main keyword of research deflectometry to pop up from Google Scholars. So Google Scholars has this cyclic scanning and it tells you when something new has come out. And I used to you know, kind of baby it in which I check every 30 days to see if something new came out in deflectometry. Cause I knew it came from a couple of major labs who do work on this, some from Germany, some from China. And so only recently did I say, all right, you, you can't do this anymore. You have to face, you got to face the music and always be kept up. So now I put it Google scholar to alert me whenever something with the word deflectometry comes up. And when I see it emailed to me as an icon, on my phone, I'm always having a heart attack because I'm like, oh my gosh, it's happening. I'm, I'm getting scooped. I, what I've worked on for a year and a half is going to get taken away. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's the only way to live. I mean, it's good because you'll, you'll, you'll read every paper that comes up such that you'll become a more familiar researcher and that perhaps you'll get better ideas or perhaps dreadfully, you'll, you'll actually get scooped and have your novel idea be published before you by a different institution. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no way around that. Everyone's at risk of being scooped. They're trying to be the fastest, you know, they're trying to be the most impactful. And you're, you're only counteraction to that is you've got to make something super novel, which decreases the likelihood of you getting scooped, but that's just added pressure on yourself. It, it is this fatiguing process. And it's, it's funny because, I mean, it's funny to me, it's probably not funny to you, but after I graduated and more so when I was in my, you know, the last year and we were working on the IR project, um, I didn't feel, I knew I was going to graduate. So I didn't feel pressured. If there that pressure of like, man, I must get these projects out. I must get papers written, converted to uh, that very overused phrase, but unfortunately it continuously is applicable, which is, you know, switch your mindset from I must, I, or I have to, to I get to. And it happened organically for me when the pressure's off, right? When it's like, ah, I'm going to graduate. People seem to respect my work. Um, so this is awesome. I, you know, I, I get to work with a mechanical engineering expert who can, who can craft, a, you know, a custom box and help me out on this project. I mean, this is a lot of fun. And, um, and if someone uh, in that mechanical engineering person for the listeners it was Henry, but, uh, you know, if someone, quote unquote, scooped the project, that didn't seem... That didn't seem worrying to me because that's cool. I, I thought infinite deflectometry was really exciting. And if somebody did something else that, you know, somehow perfectly aligned, uh, awesome. I want to talk to them. And, you know, what's the next thing that we could do? So when there's nothing writing on it, I think that research takes a totally different perspective on it. And that being said, I want to add the caveat. I like writing a lot. So I like writing papers. I think that's not the case for a bunch of people, um, which is its own stressor. But when you're at the stage that you're at, there is a clear goal, which is to complete grad school. And to do that, you have to get these papers out. Um, so it's almost, 
you know, there's just an absurd amount writing on it, unfortunately, uh, which I think delivers us nicely into kind of the, uh, the topic that I was hoping we'd get to, which is in, you know, at that time, I worked through deciding a project. I would go into lab, set things up, work on it, uh, spend far too much time watching NBA basketball games with uh, my old lab mate, Cal. Uh, and eventually we got results and I write up a paper and it's published. Uh, you cannot do that. So I don't want you to put your, to your work in jeopardy of getting scooped. So without saying too much what your work is about, can you comment how you're accomplishing doing research at this point? Sure. Um, I would say I've, right now, um, I think the best, most motivating way of framing my goals is that um, recently I've been interviewing with a couple companies and they'd asked me about my realm of expertise, which is becoming opti optical metrology. And so it's scary because when they talk to me and they're not from the field of optical metrology, they listen to me as if I'm the expert. And the reality is I will be the expert if I choose to join a certain team. And it's terrifying to me that if I say something is trustworthy, they'll completely have faith in me. And that if something goes wrong, it's completely on me. So what's more terrifying is that I'll go out of the PhD, put potentially three papers in maybe an unbelievably short amount of time and still know nothing and not get what I came for. So I'm regarding this next full phase of being a research associate, which is, I guess, what they call you after you've passed the comprehensive exam. Um, it's just a stage of learning. You know, what did I come here for? I wanted, one, to become an interesting person, two, to become a world expert in something. And, you know, you, you don't really get to have that second part if you don't talk to as many smart and interesting people as possible while you're still at this college. Um, so for me, you know, I'm reading a lot. I'm trying to talk to more people or summon the courage to talk to them, um, as well as talk to the people in my lab because they may be graduating soon. For example, Hyung Mo, who is a fifth year grad student in our lab is one of the gods of optical design. And I constantly refer to him when I don't know something because I, I, I trust him blindly, which I shouldn't, but it's good, you know, trusting him blindly is usually not a bad choice. So, uh, you know, I'm for research, something I'm considering that he's going to be graduating soon and I'm going to be a senior. And that's terrifying because people will be coming for me for help and I have to know these questions. So the process of research is constantly reassuring myself to know what I'm doing, to know if the devices I'm using, which I'll cite on papers are actually worth something, right? And so I go back to these tools in which I think I could have blindly trusted and actually questioning them. So I've been making a lot of tools for myself to see if they're worth uh, you know, their weight. So research at home is difficult because I'm a hardware guy and I'm testing a lot of my own setups with things I design in 3D print. Um, you know, I'm measuring things that I 3D print, making full setups to make different measurements, which are built on my initial primary um, measurement instruments. And so this is what that kind of looks like. I'm going to um, share a couple slides on what that looks like. Um, if you can en enable the screen share. So this is this is quite exciting. This is uh, we're doing we get to do a live demonstration of the difficulties of doing research during COVID. Okay, let me see. Advanced sharing options and all participants. Yes. There you are. You should be set up. Okay. Um, and it's not going to be a full screen share. It's just going to be the PowerPoint slides, but that should be fine. Um, so it's just a couple of pictures I put together. Does that look like yep. a PowerPoint? At home okay. tools. It looks like a PowerPoint to me. So one of the things that I was resistant to coming to optics was, you know, can you 3D print things to mount things? And the answer became yes, because more often than that, I've seen papers with things hot glued to mounts, and I figured that 3D printing would be okay because it's more mechanically uh, designed than a bunch of hot glue. And so this is my own 3D printer in which I just, I um, print stuff at home. This is something I bought. I used to be a 3D print technician, and I used to look over 50 3D printers, and that's why I bought this one because I know how to fix it, calibrate it. Um, so 
I, for example, in 2020, I had 347 unique prints. That's how many I counted, things I designed and just made fixtures for. Um, and these aren't even duplicates, just unique prints, right? Um, and so the problem with 3D printing is that you don't know if a print is going to succeed or fail. And then over time, you just have to learn based on part geometry, how to design something, how to resize a hole, because you know whether it's coming out of the side or at the bottom or at the top, just those slight nuances. Um, and when you 3D print something, you want to measure it with calipers. For example, this cube is on the right in which it's a 20 millimeter by 20 millimeter cube. Um, and I print it and calibrate it such that it comes out by 20 by 20 every single time. And how you do that is you print a really, really big piece, um, which might say, hey, you know, you designated 120 by 120 millimeters, but it came out 121 by 119. Well, what do you do? You recalibrate the motors and stepper drivers to um, interpret a different scale factor for how many steps you take per what you tell it to how far to go. And so I calibrated the ellipticity to 1 1,000th. 1, um, I figured out a method to get really shiny prints, and this indicates that your bed is flat. And I have yet to measure this, but I've got it down pretty consistently, so I can get pretty specular things with this. Um, I can print things that are circular to 1 1,000th and not be an ellipse, because that's important, because I print mass for um, some lab mates. Um, and so that's just one example. I have to have this down to a science. I have to know um, how to print something because it's going to take eight hours and I don't want to repeat that. And my PI is meeting with me in 10 hours. So, you know, I better get it right. Um, and it's happened quite a bit more than I liked. Um, something that happens often is kinematic couplings um, in which if you want highly repeatable measurements, you have to be able to create quasi kinematic repeatable structures in which you have a ball that can only fit into, let's say, two flats in a specific way. And if you constrain six degrees of freedom, well, you get something that goes in the same position every time you put the ball into the two cylinders. And so using about $6 worth of hardware from your master car and some pre-weighting mechanisms by just heavy steel posts from Thor Labs, I got a repeatability of about 47 arc seconds. So you design, I designed something in SolidWorks, put it together, glued it together, and then I put a laser um, onto this and then st stared about four meters away and then just repeatedly violently dropped this back and forth the balls into these, uh, I guess, cylinders. Um, and then I got a bunch of dots on this grid of paper and got the RMS, I guess, centroid between all, you know, and it'll deviate every single time because I touched uh, some of the balls with my finger, which leaves a little bit of grease. Um, but that was pretty good, and I use these pretty consistently now. And someone in my lab, lab uses this design. Um, so I had to completely, I mean, I didn't, I, I had to completely like figure out how to do this and get a methodology that works. Um, and that's just for one assembly. Um, I built a polariscope in which, you know, sometimes you need to, well, I didn't, by, by build a polariscope, I mean, just do mounting and assembly. Um, so I have a Lambertian, pretty Lambertian source. It's a drawing pad that acts as a unpolarized light source. Um, I've got a polarizer, linear polarizer from Thor Labs. Um, and then I've got um, a couple filters um, in which I can put wave plates or other polarizers and just put a cell phone in front of it. Like in the middle picture, that's a cell phone mount so that I can observe the birefringence of an optical element I'm using and maybe see if something is it's come up before, but I've had to identify if something is plastic or glass. And rather than putting a soldering iron to it, I'd rather do it with a polariscope where the plastic one would see a lot of um, internal stress and induce retardance. So building that was is actually a pretty big part of my arsenal now. Um, so how about tools, right? Like, how do you know if this, this is called a laser distance measurer? And these are really cheap. You can get it for about 40 bucks on Amazon. What you do is it's a laser that points at a surface that scatters and some of the light comes back and is taken in by a huge lens right, a lens right adjacent to the laser and it calculates the time of flight and divides it in a half. An avalanche photodiode, which is the, at the very end of this and is responsive, right, rising edge mode up to you know, hundreds of picoseconds, um, you know, that's gonna be your minimum error. Um, I want to test if this was actually accurate to two millimeters, one millimeter, because this is a pretty convenient way to see how far things are in an optical setup I'll build. So I have to build this stair step kind of calibrator in which I use different distances to see if I could actually trust the sensitivity and also absolute accuracy. 
And, you know, these manufacturers were actually all right. They were accurate and sensitive to within two millimeters. And ultimately, you cannot beat the response time of the photodiode, which is why their stated uncertainty is always two millimeters. But that was good to know because we have been blindly using these. And how can you publish without the confidence of your measurement basic instrument tools? Which, um, which I, I want to interject here happens a lot. The uncalibrated, uncalibrated or unchecked uh, things are published all the time. This yeah, is and it's mine as a paper reviewer. So I just, I just want to make that comment. <laughs> yeah, it's it's scary because you know, I we I've read papers in my first year, we read them my second, and I'm reading rereading them now, and I can understand them more, and I have even more questions for the authors, right? Um, and I guess that's a sign of becoming paranoid, and I guess what you do when you become an expert of something or when you're becoming an expert at something. So it's, it's rightfully so we're um, doing these things. Uh, right. And yeah, you're, trying, I, you're trying to measure when it comes to optimal, optical metrology, you're trying to measure stuff on the nanometer scale, which I don't have my analogies down anymore, but it's, you know, fractions of a fraction of the width of a human hair kind of thing. Um, so if your things are uncalibrated to millimeters, that's not that's that doesn't bode well right if you're trying to get that kind of accuracy that's correct right and even little things like if i'm using a rotation stage um there's some famous experiments um that were used in the 90s and also the 80s uh it wasn't published in the 80s yet but it was in the 90s um uh you know where you can use a rotation stage to measure to remove many many systematic errors However, what happens if your rotation stage doesn't move in discrete intervals? What if 60 degrees that you told the computer to drive your motor was actually 59.8? How does it affect it? Well, you can't really trust it, right? What if you have something wrong, right? If you're actually off a little bit, you get some high frequency errors, which is something you absolutely cannot have for the crazy optics we're trying to measure. And so with that, I was not even able to trust the motors um, I used to use, and I had to build this entire on, on the right is just some encoder encoder chips and that supports four encoders that measured up to 0 0.02 degrees accuracy. And I had to set up this thing that was robust, robust and reconfigurable between my systems just to monitor open loop what I told a stepper to go to and what actually how far it went. And um, this was super useful because I learned it wasn't in fact uh, going at certain discrete steps. You know, there was variance over time, there's variance with heat. There was so much variance that I couldn't trust. And now I just do open loop recording in order to get the exact position something moved to rather than trusting blindly that it rotated in discrete steps. And so that was horrifying to me, but it had to be done. And building this tool took like a literal week because I had to think about how this could go wrong. I had to self calibrate this too because I had to use two encoders from the same manufacturer and put it on the same shaft and see how much they deviated over a large run. It, it was nuts, but it had to be done because you, you, you don't know. Uh, and you don't want to, you know, there's that potential guilt if you publish something wrong or misinterpret results and got lucky. I, I don't think I can live with that. Uh, so yeah, just the, building a tool to help my setups. I get maybe that's a part of the PhD. You know, for example, Logan used to talk about building his own, um, um, I guess, pipelines for figure for figures that were automated. Just because every time he wanted to present something new to the PI. Well, you don't want to redo the figures every single time. You should just have that automated. And so I'm not quite there yet. I'm not where he was, but I will be soon. And I think it's it's a very good idea. Um, building these tools saves so much time. And you learn, I'm learning how to be a better PhD student. Um, lastly, we reached actual deflectometry, which is what I'm doing. And so this is just a simple setup inside my house. Um, you know, it's got a screen, it's got a camera, it's got a, um, it's got the test optic. and a laptop. And so I've got this huge, huge desk in the middle of my living room full of just test setups and stuff. And I wish I had another picture. Um, but all of the technologies I've been using go for a single measurement. Because um, I, I don't want to go into lab. If I go into lab, I have to split allocated lab time with other people because we don't want one or two, two people in the same room at the same time. It's, it's, it's not great. So the best way to move rapidly is to do it inside your own house. And so that, that, that's, that's what it takes. That, that's what research is during COVID, to be at home, to be a hardware person. You've got to build your own tools so that you can access your hardware anytime. You have to make sure all your tools work. 
And then, you know, it's hard because someone, your lab mate's not going to walk in and say, hey, you should watch out for that. I'll say this from experience. You have to ask them for that. And you have to, I don't know, it's taken a lot more vulnerability to do that rather than most, we're lucky that our lab, the large optics fabrication and testing group is very, we have very open hearts and we help each other a lot. And you, you, you have to search for it these days. Um, and get them to come out of the way to look at your setups because they don't casually pass by. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I had to share about that. Um, any, I'll, I'll leave it back to you. That was a long tirade. No, no, no. That was that was exactly what I uh, was looking for. I mean, that's all very impressive work. And and I think um, you're you're lucky that you closed the share screen. I was going to put you on the spot and ask that you explain what uh, deflectometry is, but that'd be a little unfair. Um, uh, at this point. So what I do want to say is what it's, it's clear then from the hardware perspective, what's missing or what's different. You have to make your own hardware. You have to evaluate whether or not it works. Um, and you don't, you don't have, you know, a lab mate casually popping their head in and saying, you know, why is it set up like that? That actually might not work or, oh, don't trust that rotation stage. You know, who knows how accurate it is. Um, which was something that I had, right? I, I had these peers, I had their comments. Uh, I knew which machines not to trust and which ones you could trust. Um, but what are the intangibles that are different? That's something that I'm quite curious about. Um, and, th and that's an open-ended question. So I give you a little more details. One example is, you know, um, friends in lab were a huge motivator to A, go into lab, and B, to do research. Uh, because you could go set up your experiment and then talk with your buddies. And it was fun to set up the experiment. And then you could complain about it or get a beer with them and talk about it. And you get feedback. And that's kind of, that's what I would call an intangible. So what what of those has changed? Well, totally. Um, you know, one would say, one would think that PhD is this highly technical process. And, and it is, but what's it is even more so is that it's a creative process in which you think outside the box and you're not working in a vacuum. You're not working between yourself and just your peers. You're working with the people you talk to, their ideas, your discussion of those ideas with from peers, with other peers even. Um, and it's just this constantly evolving train of people talking about what would be cool, what hasn't done been done before because Re re realistically, you're, you're not going to get creative ideas that are contribute contributing to a field. You're not going to get them easily if you don't try to constantly explain them to people, justify them to people, you know, be open to criticism with people, look at other people's things, you know, criticize those, offer help with those. Um, those things really jog the mind and just being able to be on campus and, you know, go for a walk, go for a coffee, come back. Um, that I think creative space is 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 missing. I, I would say it's a dimension that 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 is certainly missing, as well as just people to encourage you to take a break. Right, you're in this vacuum right now. You're mostly alone unless um, you're on a Zoom call daily with somebody, and it's hard to pace yourself. Um, where other people's people other people are always nicer to you than you will be, and so they they've often got good advice and they're, they care about you. And, you know, when you're alone in the vacuum in a room, well, you don't know whether to push forward. And if you push too hard, you might lose the momentum for the next day or the next week. And you don't really know that, right? Uh, part of the experience of grad school and becoming of this world-class researcher is practicing and being in this environment where you talk with other people and not only focus on your thing, but help people with their stuff too. Because so many cool publications have come out of, I don't know, cross-pollinated, experiments, right? Like people who've discovered amazing things learned that they walked across to the lab next door in a different department and found the solution sitting right there. Who's to say that, uh, you know, I mean, that, that discussion is, is really your PhD, I think. It's, um, I, I think talking to my peers and I guess, I mean, you, you didn't come to university just to be on Zoom and to do experiments all by yourself. Uh, that, that interaction is what drives innovation. I, I don't know if that's, yeah. yeah. I would say interaction is pretty in, intangible. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a you know a really deep, deep insight, and it's something that uh, is probably 
probably was highly underappreciated. And I think hopefully, you know, to, to take a very morbid thing, but hopefully this is an improvement after it is that there's a greater appreciation of that human uh, aspect to things even as um, foolishly stereotyped as like robotic, but as, you know, an engineer scientist getting a PhD. Uh, I think there's a trope that um, there's no creativity in it. There's no human, you know, humanity to it. Uh, people at this level are very robotic and that's just dumb and wrong. Um, and what you're saying is, is really insightful. You know, that's kind of one of the key drivers of this creativity and innovation. So um, I would say from a very <clears throat> personal perspective, it's been interesting and I'm, I'm not complaining. I don't have anything to complain about, but it's been interesting for me during COVID uh, to be reminded by my girlfriend that I'm a very extroverted person. So I used to love um, just going and talking to people at lab, right? And then obviously after I've graduated, I used to love going and working in a coffee shop or getting that interaction with your peers and not having that uh, is, has to be very challenging, particularly with the added stress of grad school, um, even unrelated to research and accomplishing research. Um, but it looks like you have innovated quite a bit on your own for uh, working around that and working around research. I know that you and your group, or Daywook anyways, told me that you guys have uh, frequent Zoom meetings uh, and they sound fairly fun as much as a Zoom meeting can be. Uh, um, so I, I, I think that about sums it up for this portion. I don't want it to end on too morbid of a note. So I'm curious not necessarily to have you defend, um, you know, grad school or, or much less grad school during COVID, but are there positives? Is there anything that's, that's fun or that's made it, you know, exciting or worth it to you during this time? Um, I mean, of course that element of reflection is very nice where in retrospect, you can value your peers and your interactions more. Um, I don't want to justify COVID with a silver linings kind of argument, but I will say that I will certainly value my peer interaction when I come back and things are more normal. Uh, and then just being able to work at home was very illuminating and showing how much actually gets done. Because going to lab can make one feel like one is doing things. Well, actually, you were just on the same Word document for six hours and got nothing done. And at home, that really comes to light. So that was kind of nice and an eye opener. But that's all I really have to say without about COVID. I think a lot of cool stuff would have more cool stuff would have come out without um, without COVID. Sure, of course. And I'm I'm certainly not trying to uh, not trying to defend COVID, uh, but more so, I guess. Uh, for example, it seems like you know if you're in grad school. Um, I don't know, it seems, well, maybe not. Maybe there, there isn't a lot that's just objectively there to be positive about. It's just stuff that you have to work through right now. Um, I would say at least that your setups are quite cool, but I'm not the one setting them up. So it's easy for me to, <laughs> to be excited about them. Um, but yeah, okay, well, with that, uh, the other portion that we usually do is the overrated versus underrated. Um, and so the way that this works is I am just going to ask you about a topic or an idea and tell me if you think it's overrated, underrated, or accurately rated. Um, and if you want, defend it, but you don't have to. And as I always say, I completely stole this from Tyler Callen's podcast. <laughs> Uh, conversations with Tyler. So, so without further ado, um, why don't we start off with uh, playing the piano? Underrated. Very cool, very fun, a lifetime hobby. Just because you started when you were young doesn't mean you should quit forever. Go back to piano, folks. 
Yeah, I've uh, I, I started to learn it, and I really have haven't uh, been quite as rigorous in keeping up with it. But I will say that it is a lot of fun. Um, okay, the next one. This is going to be this is going to be a bit of a harder one, but I think I already know your uh, your opinion. But the author uh, Vladimir, and I'm going to butcher his name, Vladimir uh, Nabokov who for our audience members was the, his most famous book is Lolita. I would say he's accurately, accurately uh, rated uh, by experts on America. I would, I would count it as American literature. Um, he's accurately praised as one of the people who write absolute gems of literature. And so I, I, I cannot call that underrated. Um, but I cannot call it overrated either because I've read two of the, these books and I just immediately want to reread them, but I don't have the time to accurately rate it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think you already know my opinion. I, I think it's overrated, but I need to give it an honest attempt again. Um, all right. Well, to stay on that topic, how about um, Camus, the author? Who uh, again? For, would for, say, uh, yeah. Uh, Camus is an ex <laughs> possibly existentialist, but more absurdist writer. Uh, he talks a lot about a philosophy in The Guest, The Stranger, and um, the, ooh, the, the Myth of Sisyphus. Is particularly uh, applicable right now. Yes. And so he goes over a lot of themes about, is it worth living? What is the meaning of life? And he sort of approaches it, I honestly might say. So I say he's overrated. A lot of people defend uh, nihilist versions of life, but I don't think that was what he's going for. Um, I liked a lot of the ideas, and I certainly think if I were to if I highlighted one of the books in person, I would have highlighted a quarter of the book. So still, I think it's overrated. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, what was your take? I want to hear. I think that his, uh, I think the myth of Sisyphus and therefore Camus is greatly underrated. I think that um, uh, his other books, like *The Stranger* and *The Plague*, and you know some of the other ones he listed, are grossly overrated. Uh, I just I reread *The Stranger*. I didn't like it that much. I I can say a lot of negatives about it, which I don't really need to. But at the same time, I think that uh, *The Myth of Sisyphus* is like just a devastating, remarkable book about like introspection for. You know, if you are in a hard spot, or if you're not even in a hard spot, why are you doing anything, much less what you're doing, um, and forcing that introspection of like, well, if you're doing it, you know, I, everyone has their own takeaway, but I, I just really found that book quite valuable. And it's really short, which I love. I am a little bit tired of long books right now. So that was a real gem. Um, but uh, to switch gears a little bit, <laughs> How about Taylor Swift? Oh, I don't want to alien your audience. Uh, I, uh, you should give. Let me let me let me do this actually to give you a little bit of a free runway to express yourself. I think that she is highly overrated. So I've alienated my audience, and now you should feel free to say what you want. <laughs> You know, every every band, once they've hit superstardom, every artist, once they've hit su superstardom, they do what they want, which is great. I think that's the ultimate goal of the artist. And I like country Taylor Swift and early pop Taylor Swift a lot more than edgy Taylor Swift that we see now. I would say right now, I think she's overrated because of that. Yeah, yeah. I Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I like some of her early country stuff. Um, I just, I don't know, I can't do it. I just don't particularly... Uh, like her music. That being said, you know, I'm not saying that she's not a phenomenal artist or a very creative person or independent minded or anything like that. Um, and I also will give the the clarification that I have terrible taste in music. So uh, my, my opinion doesn't mean very much. Um, okay, well, uh, we actually had some recommendations from listeners. So one of the questions uh, said that I should just outright ask you about your phenomenal cooking skills, but I want to get this in the phrase of an overrated, underrated. So how about this? Um, 
following the recipe when you are baking, overrated or underrated? Totally overrated. Like if you read any cooking blogs, they're like, oh, put a pinch of this, uh, you know, um, let's let, let a clump of coriander fall from the harbor of your palm. Like, what is this? Like, why? Why, why, do, you, why do you do this? Like, it's, the, here's the thing though, like baking, when the American calibrated oven is probably off by 25 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, what does it matter? Like, you, you need to, first of all, calibrate your equipment, okay? Get a real thermometer, make sure your, your thermometers are the right thing. Make sure your thermometers are, me are measuring liquid or solids right? Who cares if you added a pinch too much salt? Like it, I, I, it, it's, it's also an art and experimental thing, which is I think why people tell such personal stories in their cooking, because it's a very artistic and personal thing. And your taste will, you know, if I felt good when adding two tablespoons of sugar instead of one and a half, and I, you know, something great happened that day, well, I'm going to keep going with that forever. And it's going to taste sweeter to me than, you know, uh, it, it would have straight from the recipe. What? Deviate. Go ahead. Yeah, I can't agree strongly enough. I think that the joy of cooking and baking is uh, making something as you see fit. So I, I often don't follow the recipe. I'm glad to hear you say that, though. Baking, well, usually, agree. People, usually people on baking are very, very by the book. Um, but and I don't know, I, who knows how many people will take your your advice to calibrate their cooking instruments. I kind of like that, though. Uh, um, all right, well, maybe the now, the last one, it's not even going to be overrated or underrated. It's going to be a comparison. Do you think that the Marvel series is better than the Star Wars series? Oh, Speaking oh. of alienating the audience, this is, uh, this is really putting in the hot seat. You know, with, I think, John Favreau taking such a huge, huge hand over both series, they're getting to the same level of quality. Um, I think that's wishy-washy, but uh, it's hard to say. I would say both are being Disney-fied, for better or worse. And um, you, you, you see a more well-calibrated well version of an excellent film, which will get better reviews. But I don't know about the risk-taking about future years. I, it's hard to say. Um, some risk-taking has been good. I would actually say all the risk-taking has been good. But who's to say that risk taking will continue for both franchises um, under the the, <laughs> the hand of capitalism? Who who knows? I, I don't know. I'd say both would buck under the same trends. I, I can't say. Yeah. All right. Both ail from it. Yeah, I like I like that answer. Um, all right. Well, I don't necessarily have any more overrated or underrated questions for you. If you have any parting thoughts, if you have any advice for listeners or anything else that you want to comment on, please let me, you know. Please share it. But otherwise, that's all I got. No, I, I hope you were able to cover what you wanted, and I hope that I was able to provide some perspective of someone doing hardware stuff during COVID. Um, I expressed myself as honestly and vulnerably as I as I could. Um, I'm surprised you didn't get more into the uh, uh, sheer sheer dread of grad school in your experience, but I, I think I just have to think about your comments more and ask you for exactly, explicitly what you wrote in your journal. And upon rehearing this this podcast episode, I think I'll hear that. So that, that'll be fine. All right. Well, I yeah, <laughs> I'm sure at some point uh, after after things have settled down some more, maybe uh, and COVID COVID isn't quite pressing. We can sit down over a beer and uh, I can read my journal to you. <laughs> oh, I'm so, I would be so happy to hear that. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for uh, doing the interview as always. Yeah. Thanks, Logan.